Okay. Well, we're going to get started because Fred has a wonderful presentation for us tonight, but we'll be very sad as of next week when Fred is no longer joining us unless he wants to join us for fun. Um, because starting next week, we're going to be changing presenters and we're going to be having Ron Janowski is going to be our presenter for the final three sessions of the fall 2020 lecture series. And that will all be with the Korean conflict, the forgotten war, the one that most people don't know much about at all. And so we're, it's gonna be an interesting time. Um, I've just finished reading two very interesting books on the Korean conflict because I have to admit, other than a cursory knowledge of it, I really didn't have all of the details about it because it's not something that really talks about. When you look at American history, it goes the end of World War II, then the beginnings of the Cold War and the nuclear scares and the different things that are going on in our own country, and then we get into Korea. And we don't really spend much time talking about it at all. And so I think it's going to be intriguing to learn really what it is and why as a country, we change so much of our military strategy to be from finishing the objective to changing the way that we fought the conflicts. And why did we fight the conflicts so shortly thereafter the end of World War II and how, when we've learned already and we've talked about already, how two nations, both the Russians and the Chinese fought us in this proxy war that ended up being in of Korea. And so it'll be very interesting. As all of our presentations have been brought to you this semester, this semester look at me talking like I'm an academic here. Nope, in this season, our World War II, our fall lecture series have been brought to us by the Birch Foundation. They are a wonderful couple that grew up and lived in West Michigan and they dedicated their lives to service to others. And they did this at the federal and the local level. Their foundation was set up by their children to honor their memory and to promote service to your country at either the federal state or local level through education. And we are very lucky that they have provided us with the funding for this fall lecture series. And again, will be helping us with our spring lecture series, which will be starting in February. We also have a media sponsor of Blue Lake and they um, have been our media sponsor for many years and they do just a fabulous job in the community. And we are so proud to be partnering with them. Tonight's lecturer is Fred Johnson, who if you've come to our previous lectures, knows that he is a wonderful speaker and he's so very knowledgeable about the topics of military conflict and we're just delighted to have him here. And if you'll excuse me for one second. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. See, this is why we're all at home because you know I've dusted today and I'm sneezing. So this is why we all hang out at home. And um, without further ado, I will let Fred take over so that we can talk about the rise of the Soviet Union. Thank you all. And I have muted everyone. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to chat at the bottom of the screen there and ask that question during the presentation. At the end of the presentation, I will unmute everyone and then we can ask any questions that you would like. So thank you very much and welcome. Good evening, scholars of the Silver Size Museum. It has been a privilege these last few weeks to be able to present these topics to you. And tonight we're going to discuss the rise of the Soviet Union from the end of World War II to 1950, the year of the Korean conflict. Peg mentioned that Burl had a question about why the United States and the Soviet Union that had been with such seemingly good allies during World War II eventually became adversaries so soon in the post-war period. Well, the first thing to remember is that the alliance during World War II was one more out of necessity than one of convenience. They were had a common enemy in the Nazis, definitely in Europe, and also a common enemy in the Japanese in the Pacific. But I thought that 
given that Burrow started that way, a good way to start this will be to take a look first at the situation in 1945 at the end of World War II. This map shows just exactly how far Russia had expanded and was expanding into Eastern Europe from 1945. You can see they already were in the Baltic states of Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Belarus, Ukraine, but that will continue. To understand Beryl and others about why, the, why that alliance broke down, I decided that it might be a, a, a better way of just talking about what the alliance was and the steps by which it broke down is to take a look at the people who were involved. And of course, the primary character in this drama who was involved in that breakdown of the alliance was a man named Joseph Stalin. So let's start there by looking at a character overview of the man who took over from the who took over the Soviet Union, took over Russia after the death of Vladimir Lenin. Joseph Vsadianovich Jugashvili, also known as Joseph Stalin, the man of steel as he called himself, was born in 1873 and died in 1953. Stalin had been a close compatriot of Vladimir Lenin, the father of the Bolshevik Revolution, the Russian Revolution, the November Revolution of 1917. But when Lenin died in 1924, there was a power struggle that developed and Stalin basically more than, inher more than inheriting the mantle of leadership, essentially bullied his way into leadership. Let me share with you a brief video, a brief bio of this man known as Stalin. In terms of ruthlessness, uh, bloodlust, Stalin remains one of the greatest villains of the 20th century. Yosef Djukashvili was born on December 18, 1879. He later changed his name to Stalin, meaning man of steel. Stalin had a very harsh childhood in terms of poverty. He had a tough life as a young man and was very quickly attracted to radical movements and causes. Between 1902 and 1913, Stalin was imprisoned eight times by the Russian secret police. Stalin's rise to power started after the Russian Revolution of 1917, when the Bolsheviks deposed the Tsar and created a communist society. Lenin died in 1924. And there was a big struggle about the succession of Lenin. Stalin eventually took over in a very complex maneuver that really showed his master skills as a manipulator of men. Under Stalin, Russia became the second largest uh, industrial economy in the world. It was all planned economies, five-year plans, and if you didn't play by his rules, you went off to a labor camp, and, or you were summarily executed in, in some fashion. Three million kulaks died as a result of Stalin's policies in the early 1930s. Now, he did increase the amount of food that was being produced, but at what cost? During what many historians term Stalin's reign of terror, no one was safe from his ambition. His forced industrialization led to countless millions of deaths and the worst man-made famine in human history. Just before World War II, Hitler and Stalin signed a non-aggression pact. That fell apart uh, in June of 1941 when Hitler invaded the Soviet Union. When the Germans turned and began to invade Russia, they underestimated Joe Stalin. The siege of Stalingrad was so great there was no food on either side. So the German soldiers would give little children who were residents of Stalingrad, a crust of bread if they would fill their canteens from the Volvo River. And as the children came back into Stalingrad, they were shot by Stalin snipers. That's how he consolidated his power. The most uh, feared man in Russia, and with very good reason. The Soviet Union lost an estimated 20 million people during World War II, more than any other nation. During the big three conferences, Stalin demanded much of Eastern Europe as compensation. Stalin established an iron curtain from the Baltic to the Adriatic Sea. The Soviet Union was a major superpower with the potential of a nuclear arsenal in 1949. 
So that meant he had brought the Soviet Union from a minor regional power in Europe to a global superpower. On March 5th, 1953, Joseph Stalin died. Stalin is regarded by many Russian citizens as a great man. The, they had enormous pride in what he did for their country. Uh, he raised it to a level that it had not been before. He was mostly feared. He gave us the KGB. He gave us the Soviet labor camps. He gave us summary executions. We don't know how many people died at his hand in his own country for both reasons that were real and imagined because they did not play by Stalin's rules. I think Stalin's image today is increasingly concentrated around his role as one of the greatest mass murderers of the 20th century. So then, to answer Burroughs' question, why did the alliance break down? We had to consider the person who was the, in charge of the country who was such a significant part of that alliance. And this picture you see right here is a picture of Joseph Stalin visiting Lenin and Gorky in 1923. Lenin in the, in the mid 1920s suffered from a series of strokes. And in this painting, as it says, Lenin who was in semi-retirement after suffering his second stroke died the following year, making a way for Stalin to succeed him as leader of the Soviet Union. To have an alliance that is going to hold and that is going to be one of integrity between all of the parties involved means that, means that all of the parties involved must trust each other. And if there was one thing that Joseph Stalin was not known for, it was his trust in other people. He was called paranoid, he was called a murderer, and indeed he was a murderer, but trust was not a strong suit for him. And as we shall see, the alliance eventually breaks down because of stole Joseph Stalin's own personal flaws, but because he never really trusted the West to begin with. He never trusted the people in his own circle as became too apparent after Lenin died so suddenly. And a chief opponent of Joseph Stalin was Leon Trotsky, born 1879 and died in 1940. Leon Trotsky, for many historians, was the one who made the Bolshevik Revolution a success. Soon after the Bolshevik Revolution of the November Revolution of 1917, it should come as no surprise to us that there were many people inside of Russia who were opposed to communism, who were opposed to the Bolsheviks. And so a civil war broke out in 1917 and 1918. And this is in the middle of, or still during World War I. Russia had been a major ally of the Western, of the Western Alliance, meaning the British and the French, the Triple Entente during the war. But when the Bolshevik Revolution took place, Lenin and those of his followers, to include Trotsky, did not see any reason why the Russians should be fighting a war that, frankly, they considered to be just a big squabble against capitalists whom they had disavowed. In the civil war that followed, Leon Trotsky was the one who founded the Red Army that eventually brought success to the Bolshevik Revolution and allowed the nation of the USSR, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, to be established. Some background on Trotsky. Russian Marxist revolutionary Leon Trotsky was born Lev Davidovich Bronstein on November 7, 1879 in the Ukraine to prosperous Jewish farmer parents. As a young man, Trotsky spread the ideals of socialism and tried to unionize Russian workers. There was fairly widespread support for change, and he was inspired by socialist message. He was sort of taking measures to overcome what had been a very inequitable social system. It was at this time that he became acquainted with fellow revolutionary Vladimir Lenin. It was inevitable that an ambitious and intelligent young socialist in Russia, as Trotsky was, would come into contact with the ideas and eventually the person of Lenin sooner or later. And once they did, they forged this lifetime relationship 
Lenin was a leader of the Bolsheviks who rose to power during the October Revolution in 1917. Trotsky joined the Bolsheviks right before the revolution and became a leader within the party. Trotsky was one of the most important figures in the Russian Revolution, second only to Lenin in his charisma, his mobilizing, organizing capacities, and second only to Lenin in his revolutionary fervor. After the Bolsheviks took power, they were immediately besieged on all sides. The so-called whites, the monarchists, the liberals, as well as foreign interventionists, all wanted to overturn their revolution. So the Bolsheviks had to immediately create an army. Somebody had to create a new army, and that somebody was Trotsky. In 1920, after three years of fighting, Trotsky's Red Army won the Russian Civil War for the Bolsheviks, who united the country as the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, or the USSR. Trotsky's longtime friend and Soviet leader Vladimir Lenin died in 1924, and a power struggle began for the right to succeed him. Trotsky was the favorite candidate because he was the best known. He was at Lenin's side at those key moments in the Civil War. Nobody was more important to the Soviet victory and support of Lenin than Trotsky. Joseph Stalin, the general secretary of the Communist Party, also made a play for Lenin's vacated seat. Lenin would only trust Stalin with party appointments, but precisely that job the clever Stalin understood, allowed him to build up a growing base of support, of loyalists, of people that when he called on them, would remember what they owed him and vote the way he told them. In 1924, Joseph Stalin became the de facto leader of the Soviet Union. By 1927, Leon Trotsky was thrown out of the Communist Party and exiled. Trotsky arrived in Mexico in 1936 and lived in Mexico City in the Blue House, which was the residence of Diego Rivera and Frida Kahlo. Trotsky was too prominent, too opinionated, and too well admired the world over to go into a quiet retirement. He gave interviews, he wrote, he published, and remained squarely in the public eye. Trotskyism, Trotsky's interpretation of Marxism, grew in popularity. At a certain point, Trotsky's criticism couldn't be tolerated anymore. Trotsky was indeed becoming a hero, an alternative, not only for other European countries and would-be socialist revolutionaries, but even an object of fond memory and an alternative path to Stalin in Soviet Russia. On the orders of Joseph Stalin, Leon Trotsky was killed on August 21st, 1940, while exiled in Mexico. Trotsky's head was smashed in by an ice pick, a Spanish socialist hired assassin loyal to Soviet Russia ended Trotsky's life so brutally. Trotsky lives on as a martyr and a symbol of what might have been. This was the true son of the revolution, the true heir to Lenin, who was never given a chance. Silver Science Scholars, we should take a moment and reflect upon what was just said about the relationship between Trotsky and Lenin and Joseph Stalin. Trotsky was the one who was considered to be the intellectual heart and soul of the Bolshevik Revolution. He was the one who founded the Red Army. He was the one who organized the resistance against the white Russians, the monarchists, wanted to reestablish the Tsar, and who also fought against foreign intervention the British and the Americans who invaded in 1918, trying to stop the revolution. He eventually finds himself in a power struggle against Joseph Stalin and is undermined because Joseph Stalin has made himself, has ingratiated himself so much with Lenin that upon Lenin's death, Stalin is able to move the machinery of the Bolshevik revolution, move the machinery of the communist party as it was then against Trotsky, the man who made the revolution possible and have him exiled, thrown out of the country and eventually Trotsky goes to Mexico City. And in 1940, many years after the revolution is done, after the Soviet Union has been established for at least 16 years, even then in 1940, Stalin orders an agent around the world, a half a world away to plant an ice pick in the center of Trotsky's head. This is a man 
who understands one thing, power. He's willing to do anything to, to get his way. He is shrewd, he is manipulative, and he cannot be underestimated. Going again back to Burroughs' question, why did, the, why did the alliance between the Soviet Union and the United States break down? Consider the individual that we were dealing with, someone who was willing to starve his own citizens, someone who was willing to undermine someone who had been at the heart of the revolution, someone who had no loyalty to anything but power in himself. This is the alliance that the Americans had with the British and the Russians during World War II. Let's keep moving. That, hum, that Holodomor, which was another example of just exactly how far Stalin was willing to go to achieve his ends. And he was not known necessarily as an ideologue or someone who was truly dedicated to the doctrines of Marxism, but he was definitely dedicated to totalitarian government and bending people to his will as the man of steel, as he considered himself to be, would have fancied it and did everything he could to make that reality come true. The Holodomor was called one of the worst man-made famines of the 20th century and no better description could have been given. In the early 1930s, millions of Ukraine's people died in a devastating famine. Known as the Holodomor, it is one of the most tragic chapters in Ukrainian history. When Ukraine became a part of the Soviet Union in 1922, it was the country's breadbasket, thanks to its fertile fields of wheat. In 1928, Soviet leader Joseph Stalin introduced collectivization, which was supposed to unite privately owned farms into state collective farms called kolkhoz. The Soviet leadership argued that collective farms would be more effective and produce a surplus, which would feed industrial workers. As many Ukrainian peasants were not willing to hand over their land to the state, their fields were confiscated. Many of them were sent into exile or abandoned their homes. In 1932, the government's quota on crops was raised significantly, and farmers were expected to harvest more than before. For many, it was a target that was impossible to meet. What grain they produced was confiscated with nothing left for them or their families. Farmers who hoarded their crops were often punished or executed. The exact number of people who died in the famine of 1932 and 1933 is still not known. Historians estimate that between three and 12 million people perished, most of them ethnic Ukrainians. For decades, the existence of the famine was denied by the Soviet Union. Historians in Russia and the West disagree as to whether the famine was man-made and if it was a deliberate attempt to eradicate Ukrainian independence. Since 2006, Ukraine and 15 other countries have recognized the Holodomor as a genocide against the Ukrainian people. I submit to you that Joseph Stalin was a man who, if he had a conscience, he hid it very well. Starving three to 12 million Ukrainians in what had been a fertile part of Russia, the breadbasket of the Soviet Union, to ensure that his power was consolidated. Again, alliances between nations are not between nations and nation states. Alliances between nations result because leaders of nations decide to have those alliances. So what do you think it was like to be an ally of a man like that who would wage such misery, impose such misery onto his own people? He clearly was somebody who did not know any limits to the excesses of power. In fact, excesses of power didn't have any residence inside of Joseph Stalin's makeup. Whatever the means was, the ends justified it. So we should not be at all surprised that someone who was willing to go to such lengths to acquire power, expand power, maintain power, and consolidate power, also on August 23rd, 1939, would do something else that would catch the world off guard. Because on that day, in 1939, Joseph Stalin, one of the 20th century's biggest murderers, signed an agreement with another of the 20th century's biggest murderers, 
Adolf Hitler and something called the Nazi Soviet Non-Aggression Pact. This was an act of the most high level political cynicism and just outright evil imaginable. In one sense, the Soviet Union had been ostracized internationally because at the end of World War I, the Western powers basically made the Soviet Union a pariah because it turned its back on its obligations so England, France, and the United States felt in World War I by pulling out of the war in 1918 with something called the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. In that instance, that treaty, the Russians said, you know what, World War I, not our problem, they left. The Western allies then had to face the full might of Imperial Germany's army. The only thing that saved it was the fact that the United States had entered the war in 1917 and Imperial Germany's army was pretty much exhausted by then. But people never forgot that. And then during the post-war world, because Imperial Germany had was blamed for starting the war, it too was an international pariah. So if there's a lesson for us about this today, it is a lesson about the price that one may pay when you exclude people that you should want to have, not necessarily, not necessarily in your orbit, but can you really afford to not deal with people who are acting in a negative way internationally, even if you find their behavior repugnant? Either way, on August 22nd, 1939. Joseph Stalin signed the Nazi Soviet Non Aggression Pact for a very simple reason. In addition to what he had done with the famine of the Ukrainian people, he had waged war and purges during the 1930s upon his military and political establishment with such effectiveness that he practically decapitated the leadership of his generals, especially those that had any kind of wartime experience. And given that the war clouds of Europe were gathering fast in August 1939, Joseph Stalin understood very cynically that Adolf Hitler was sooner or later going to come for Soviet Russia. And Adolf Hitler, having been a soldier in the Imperial German Army during World War I, he was determined to not make the mistake that had been fought in World War, that had been made in World War I and fight a two-front war. He needed to have his Eastern Front locked down or at least neutralized while he turned his full attention to the West. And once he got through with the West, his full intention was to turn his attention to the East and increase what he called Lebensraum, living space. And he had his eye on that same area that Stalin had, had treated so horribly, the Ukraine, the breadbasket of the Soviet Union, because Hitler wanted those grain fields to feed that expanding German nation, the Third Reich. You can see from these political cartoons how people felt about it. Hitler on the left, the scum of the earth, I believe. And then Stalin, the bloody assassin of the workers, I presume. Or this one, somebody wondering, how long will the honeymoon last? And then this one, we see here on June 22nd, 1941, Stalin had bought himself about a year and a half, two years worth of time. But even with two years of time, when Hitler had been waging war in Western Europe, seizing Norway, conquering the Netherlands, fighting against Great Britain, the Battle of Britain in 1940, taking all of France. After all of that, he finally turned his attention to the East. And on June 22nd, 1941, Operation Barbarossa was launched and the Wehrmacht and the Luftwaffe invaded Russian territory across the Soviet frontier. It was horrific. The state of Stalin's armies were so weakened they were so dismal, they have been so hollowed out that the Germans practically faced no opposition as they went through. It was victory after victory after victory. Stalin's forces had no choice but to fall back into the vast, deep interior of the Soviet Union. And it was only then that the Russian people began to realize and understand just how devastating his leadership had been. It has, been, it has been, been documented that Stalin's leadership during the 1930s, him as a leader, he was so horrible that when German units showed up in some villages and towns inside the Soviet Union, they were greeted as liberators. Think about that. Who greets Nazis as liberators? That gives us an idea of how horrible Stalin must have been himself for people to think that the Nazis were coming to give them a break. But all too soon, the Russians found out 
that just as Hitler had written in Mein Kampf, Mein Struggle, the book that he wrote in the 1920s, that the Nazis had no love for, they had no love for communists. And if you were a communist, the only thing you could be worse than a communist was to be a communist Jew. And so the Nazis waged a kind of war upon people that still leaves us scratching our head, trying to figure out truly was that warfare or was it something different, something worse, something maniacal? But it became very apparent very quickly that the war that the Germans were inflicting upon the Russian people was something of a different animal. This picture right here, probably one of the most disturbing to come out of all of World War II. And think about this, a war where there are plenty of, dis plenty of disturbing pictures. This one rates at the top because this is the activity of a group of people called the Einsatzgruppen, the Einsatzgruppen, the killing squads uh, that belonged to the SS, the Schutzstaffel, commanded by Reinhard Heydrich, unleashed to complete something called, eventually it will be called the Final Solution. But the Einsatzgruppen, they went around murdering Jews, innocent men, women, and children. Although in the eyes of the Nazis, there was no such thing as an innocent woman, man, or child if they were a Russian. If you are interested in such things, there is a book written by an historian named Christopher Browning entitled Ordinary Men. It covers the activities of a police battalion 101 who are part of the Einsatzgruppen, and it goes through their, the time that they were formed all the way through the war. This police battalion, the, the Einsatzgruppen, these were not men who were in their prime in their, in their 20s and 30s. These were men who were still in their 40s and 50s. They were, they were too old to be on the front line, but not so old they could not participate. So they were dragooned into service and their job was to give in to assassinate, to eliminate people. Essentially, they turned them into killers. And this book is a very, very sobering reminder that that possibility exists in all of us, ordinary men. As the war in Russia continued and when German soldiers were wounded and they went back to Germany, they were told not to say anything about the realities of the war on the Eastern Front. And well, they should have been told to be quiet because slowly the word got out and German civilians began to understand that if the Soviet bear ever turned its attention, started moving from, from east to west, there was going to be some significant payback being meted out by the very, very angered and enraged Red Army. Eventually, that's exactly what happened. On June 6, 1944, American, British, and Canadian troops landed at Normandy at five beachheads, Utah, Omaha, Gold, Juno, and Sword. And the, the great catastrophe that the Germans, civilians thought was gonna befall them became all too real. And this became another sticking point, another break point for Stalin as our ally to understand why things broke down so fast after the end of World War II. For years since the invasion of the Soviet Union from 1941 to 1944, Joseph Stalin had been asking Winston Churchill and Franklin Delano Roosevelt for a second front. He was of the opinion that the Americans and the British, the West, in other words, the West was letting the Russians get beat up, get pummeled, get destroyed so that when the war finally ended, all they would have to do is come in, sweep out the Bolsheviks, sweep out the, sweep out the communists and take over the country. This man of ruthlessness and power and paranoia and distrust, he thought that Roosevelt and Churchill were simply delaying establishing a second front. But finally, the second front was there with the Normandy landing. But by then, the seeds of distrust had already grown very wide and large in Stalin's mind. This picture right here is showing the end of the war with the flag of the Soviet Union over Berlin. The Nazis surrendered to the Russians and the Americans in two separate ceremonies in Reims, France, to the Americans and the British, and in Berlin on May 8th, 9th, 1945. And so the war in Europe ended. But we need to remember that the same paranoid, ruthless leader who understood and believed in using power was still in charge. There's no more need to have an alliance. 
since the common enemy had now been vanquished. And you can see from this map of post-war Germany, that Germany was divided into one, two, three different occupation zones. The red obviously belonging to the Soviet Union, the green belonging to the British, the blue to the French, and the orange to the Americans. But we need not, we should not stop just there. We also need to notice that inside of the red occupation zone of East Germany, there was the city of Berlin, also divided into a French zone, a British zone, an American zone, and a Russian zone. The only way or the fastest way of getting to Berlin was either by air or by ground transport. In February 1946, Joseph Stalin went before a gathering of Communist Party officials and delivered what, was, what became known as his Bolshoi speech. There's a lot to the speech, but let me summarize it. He basically said that the West could not be trusted, that it, it had caused untold misery and harm to the Russian people, and that it was out to stop the revolution, and that it would do anything and, and his hostile intentions against the Soviet Union. Now, on one hand, technically Joseph Stalin was not incorrect because even under the Nazis, Germany was still a Western nation and it had imposed untold miseries onto the Russian people. But we need to take a closer look. Joseph Stalin is saying this because he is intending to expand Russia's influence around the world. He is still a revolutionary, even a revolutionary, although not like Trotsky, he still is in intending for the world to become a, a globe of communism. Now, when Stalin gave this speech on February 9, 1940, 1946, there was a young American diplomat inside of Moscow who knew just about anything, who knew just about more than any, who knew Russia better than any other American diplomat at the time. His name was George Frost Kennan. And when Kennan learned of this speech, he wrote a 10,000 word letter called the Long Telegram back to his bosses in Washington, DC. And Kennan recommended one thing. He said many things in that letter, but he basically said that the Russians were becoming more hostile, that they become more trustful, distrustful. In other words, Stalin was becoming hostile and because he was, he was becoming hostile, so was the Soviet Union. Stalin did not trust the West. And because Stalin did not trust the West, the Soviet Union did not trust the West. Stalin was the man in charge. So whatever his viewpoint was, that was the viewpoint of his country. He did not trust the West. He was becoming hostile to the West. He meant to become more aggressive in his relationship to the West. So George Frost Kennan recommended that the best way to respond to Soviet hostility, distrust, and aggression would be to contain the Russians. And so the linchpin, the cornerstone of American foreign policy from 1946 forward all the way to the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989 became containment. In other words, wherever they go, we go there with them. If they go to Korea, we meet them there. If they go to Vietnam, we meet them there. If they go to Turkey and Greece, we meet them there. Wherever the Russians go, we're going to go there and be the countervailing force to make sure that Soviet influence was contained around the world. This political cartoon sums it up nicely. You can see the vulture of communism carrying the baby chaos to Western Europe and the doctor, the US Congress is racing to beat it there so that Western Europe does not suffer the chaos of communist rule and influence. And then something else happened on June 22nd, 1948, which when you think about it, for a man who had sought, the, for a man who had not sought, but who actually did starve three to 12 million Ukrainians. Let me repeat that. Joseph Stalin created a man-made famine, a famine that didn't have to exist. His, his policies of collectivization and seizing people's lands and executing people and sending them, sending them off to gulags and just his brutal hammer, iron hammer rule killed millions of people. 
We should not be at all surprised that someone who did that on June 22nd, 1948, cut off access from West Berlin to the Western Allies. And because Joseph Stalin was, was willing to starve West Berlin into submission, because he thought people were escaping and that the Russians needed to consolidate their rule in Eastern Germany on June 22nd, 1948, with no way to get to their sector of Berlin by land. The British and the Americans soon thereafter launched something called the Berlin Airlift that lasted from 1948 into 1949. With the Berlin Airlift, there was no further doubt that the wartime alliance between the Americans and the British and the Russians had broken down. We need to also consider too that by 1945, certainly by the time the war ended, Franklin Delano Roosevelt sadly had passed away in the spring of 1945. His successor, Harry S. Truman, elevated to the office as per our constitutional words of ascendancy. And he was surrounded by Roosevelt, Roosevelt's cabinet members, many of whom had never trusted Stalin and quite frankly had thought that Roosevelt had been too naive in dealing with the Soviet premier. But here it was in 1948, and there could be no longer any denying that Joseph Stalin and the Soviet Union were a clear and present danger. And having just fought bullies internationally like Benito Mussolini, the Italian fascist, Adolf Hitler, the German Nazi, and Hideki Tojo, the Japanese militarist, there was no way that that generation of leaders was going to confront yet a new international threat and not take decisive action like they had not done before World War II. The lesson had been learned. When you meet a bully internationally, you can try to deal with them, you can try to appease with them, but sooner or later, they were gonna come for you. And the lesson was that if you, they come for you after you try to deal with them, it ends up costing you more life, more blood and more treasure. Or to paraphrase what Winston Churchill said, Dealing with an appeaser is like be appeasing, appeasement is like feeding a crocodile, hoping that you're the last one that he eats. So for a year, Americans and the British, sometimes landing within mere moments of each other, like you see this 50, C-54 cargo master, planes landed around the clock. And just like these kids who saw these planes landing, sometimes the pilots would pull back the windows and throw out candy and sweets. Remember, this is post-war Germany. Germany, the Berlin, the capital, city of, the capital city of Germany had been bombed over and over and over and over for two and a half, three years during World War II. So there was not much to do, nothing, not much hope, nothing to build with. So these planes for a whole year brought food and clothing and heating fuel and whatever else the people in the Western sector of Berlin needed to survive. Joseph Stalin, in other words, was willing to starve people in Western Berlin to achieve his ends, just as he'd been willing to starve and had starved people in the Ukraine to achieve his ends. Beryl, this is how and why the alliance broke down. And then this happened. On August 29, 1949, the world was stunned when the Soviet Union exploded their first atomic device.
quick note about the Russians exploding their first atomic device. In the mid-1950s, Senator Joseph McCarthy of Wisconsin is going to go on a witch hunt for communists, alleged communists in the US government. It's been well established now that Joseph McCarthy was a self-serving, low life, something of a politician who created that witch hunt because he wanted to gain power for himself. He brought the country pretty much to a standstill for a good little while until a diminutive little lawyer, diminutive lawyer named Joseph Welch, during the Armand McCarthy hearings, finally asked one question. Senator McCarthy, at long last, have you no shame? And this bully Senator McCarthy, who had destroyed people's lives, destroyed their careers, and had other people turn on themselves, had other people basically just shelve their integrity, throw it out the window. When Joseph Welsh finally confronted him and said, I will not allow you to destroy another person at long last, have you no shame? It was like a collective light bulb went off over the nation's head and people remember, you know what, he's right. This is a democracy. We can't let one person, one senator run roughshod over people's lives like he's some type of a dictator and a senatorial dictator at that. Now I mentioned that Joseph McCarthy was on a witch hunt for communists. He was using communism and the possibility of communists in the government for his own nefarious purposes. But that did not mean that there weren't communists in the government. That did not mean that there weren't spies in the government because the Soviet Union in exploding its first atomic device, a lot of the information they got was through a very well oiled and active and effective spy network. That's what allowed them to build their atomic device so fast. Either way, on August 29th, 1949, America's nuclear monopoly that it had had since August 6th, 1945, when it dropped the first atomic bomb on Hiroshima and the second one on August 9th, 1945 on Nagasaki, on August 29th, 1949, that ended. Now you had two nuclear capable powers on earth and one of those powers was commanded by a man named Joseph Stalin, who had long proven and had demonstrated that he was willing to do anything and did not hesitate using power, the power at his disposal. It was a good time to worry. The reaction that the world had to that first atomic explosion is shared with us in brief here. President Truman's dramatic announcement that Russia has created an atomic explosion sends reporters racing for Flushing Meadow, where Russia's Vashinsky arrives to address the United Nations. Mr. Vashinsky, have you got any statement about President Truman's statement on the atomic bombs? Please, please, Does Russia have the atomic bombs? Yes. Well, what do you reply to me? The Russian foreign minister maintains his silence about Russia's atomic progress in his address. He accuses the West of planning atomic war and urges the outlawing of atomic weapons. But he makes no reference to Russian agreement on international inspection, keystone to control. Secretary of State Atchison says of America's stand... In connection with the president's statement that there has been an atomic explosion in the Soviet Union, I wish to emphasize that from the very beginning of the development of atomic energy, this nation has been determined to do everything in its power to proceed toward a truly effective international system of control. It would be deluding ourselves to get something on paper that was not really effective. The president's statement underlines the importance of having an effective method of control. Assembly President Romulo addresses East and West. If the announcement made by President Truman that the Soviet Union now has the atomic bomb is true, then item number 23 in the agenda of the present session of the Assembly will project itself as one of the most important questions that we will take up. The impasse that now exists regarding the international control of atomic energy must be broken, and the Assembly must face this question squarely for the sake of mankind and for the peace of the world. Did you catch that? The Assembly must face this squarely for the sake of mankind and the peace of the world. It's 1949. 
and humanity has within its grasp the power to destroy the planet and the species. The Soviet, the, the Soviet diplomat had already accused the United States of wanting to start a nuclear war. The days of the Soviet American alliance during World War II must have seemed a thousand years ago from 1949's perspective. But such was the nature of things in 1949 that in 1949, the United States took the step of establishing the North Atlantic Treaty Organization to offset Soviet influence in Western Europe. I haven't mentioned the Marshall Plan of 1947 named after former Army Chief of Staff George C. Marshall, which was called the European Recovery Act. It was billions of dollars sent to Western Europe so that it wouldn't fall under Soviet influence. To literally rebuild Europe and to form, it was one of the early things that helped to form something called the European Economic Community and tied Northwestern Europe's economy into an Atlantic community, binding it with Canada and the United States, forming a closer bond between those nations and disincentivizing them from tying themselves to the Soviet Union. Part of that, or in, after that, was North Atlantic Treaty Organization's establishment, which as you can see in 1949 from the graph here, included the United Kingdom, eventually will include Germany, eventually Italy, France, and will continue to expand all the way up to 2017. In response, the Russians established the Warsaw Pact, which included East Germany, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, not so much Yugoslavia. Yugoslavia was run by a man named Marshal Tito or Joseph Broz. He remained, somehow he managed to keep Yugoslavia out of the direct, out of the direct Soviet orbit, but he definitely leaned toward being an ally of the Soviet Union, it's just that Marshal Tito wanted to do his communism independent of Moscow. This isn't all. Under Stalin's leadership in the 1940s, immediately after World War II, the Poles, the people in Poland had sought for a minute to try and have an independent government. It was crushed by the Soviet Union. In 1956, the people in Hungary will stage a revolution, it will be crushed by the Soviet Union. In 1968, the people in Czechoslovakia will stage a revolution to try and get from up under Soviet influence. It'll be crushed by Russian tanks. But by then, by 1968, big changes would have taken place inside of the Soviet Union. Another map of the Warsaw Pact and the counterbalancing forces of NATO. The Warsaw Pact was also known during the Cold War as the East Bloc. And again, just to repeat, it included East Germany, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria. In other words, most if not all of Eastern Europe. In 1950, North Korea would cross the 38th parallel and attack South Korea. As Peg pointed out to you all at the beginning of this session, We'll have another fantastic presenter next week, which is gonna take us through all the different phases of the Korean War. But it's important to know that in 1950, Joseph Stalin, just like communist China, they were behind, they were supportive of the North Korean invasion of the South. And eventually you will find the Russians and the Chinese also on the side of the North Vietnamese and what became known as the Vietnam War. Joseph Stalin's time on earth was coming to a fast close and in 1953, he passed away. He left behind a legacy of blood, thirstiness, murder, mayhem, terror. And he did become, and he was one of the 20th century's most powerful men, but he's also one of the 20th century's most ruthless, unrepentant murderers. And he raced, he raced right up there with Mao Zedong. Adolf Hitler, the thugs and the brutes in Rwanda who conducted the genocide in 1994, Pol Pot's Vietnam or Cambodia in 1977, so much blood in the 20th century. 
as indicated here in the New York Times, Stalin dies after a 29 year rule. For 29 years, the Russian people had to live with this guy. And this was the individual that we were allied with during World War II. Again, one can only speculate whether or not we ever would have been allied with him had he not had his own existential threat and a bigger thug, a more dangerous individual, at least one as dangerous as he was, whose name was Adolf Hitler. You'll note that the headline also says, his successor not announced, US watchful, Eisenhower says. We now know from history that Joseph Stalin's successor was a man named, was a man named Nikita Sergeyevich Khrushchev who will present the world and the United States in particular with another set of challenges. But by then, the Cold War would have shifted into a new phase. Khrushchev is going to disavow all of Stalin's activities, basically disinherit him, basically slam or slander his reputation and accuse him of being an enemy of the state. But Khrushchev has a lot of blood on his own hands. And by then, by the time Khrushchev comes to power, the Nazi, rather the American Soviet alliance was already a thing of history. And from that point forward, it just became a global competition to see which nation and its allies would win the day until the Soviet Union finally fell in 1990. I'll take your questions now. Everyone, please feel free to unmute yourself if you have any questions. That was another wonderful presentation. Um, the one thing that always amazes me about this is that how quickly after World War II, China and Russia were able to rebound. Could you expand on how quickly and how they were able to rebound so quickly after having so many lost so many people and so much manufacturing and raw materials and everything else? Well, one of the one of the things explaining in China's case, Peg, is that after the Japanese were beaten in World War II, Chiang Kai-shek, who had been the leader of the Kuomintang, the nationalist Chinese, and Mao Zedong, who of course was the leader of the, of the communists, they went back, they simply just resumed the civil war that they've been having with each other for several decades before World War II even started. Now, uh, it's true that the Chinese, the, that the communists were able to take over the mainland China in 1949. That's what made this period so, this period both interesting and scary. In the same year that the communist Chinese take over mainland China, the Soviet Union, explo the Soviet Union explodes its first atomic device. And Mao Zedong, like Joseph Stalin, through the application of brute force, brute force was able to consolidate power. One of the reasons why the Chinese came in on the side of the North Koreans toward the end of 1950 was because the Americans were getting too close to China itself, having crossed the 38th parallel and would turn back to North Korean invasion. They were crossing the Yalu River and they were warned by diplomatic sources, a, dip a diplomat from India, that if they got any closer, kept on getting closer, that the Chinese would come in on the side of the North Koreans. That is exactly what happened. And so we, I don't think sometimes we appreciate how weak Mao's position was in 1950, having just seized the, having just seized the country, he needed to have time to consolidate all, consolidate all that power. And indeed, in the years following that, he used a brutal iron hand and making sure he stamped out all competition, all dissension. Now, in the case of the Soviet Union, as one, as one of my college professors said it, every mile that a Russian tank traveled going from east to west in World War II, when at the end of the war, they stayed at every mile. They didn't give up not one inch of territory. And so Russia went on a massive rebuilding campaign. In many cases, they disassembled entire factories in Germany and took them back to Russia. So again, with a lot of ruthless application of force, the Russian people, it wasn't an easy recovery for them, but when you have that kind of just sinister leadership, people are compelled to do some amazing things. And the quick recovery wasn't so much a quick economic recovery, the standard of living in China and the standard of living in the Soviet Union 
didn't go through the roof. But what did happen was that both of those leaders, Mao Zedong and Joseph Stalin, they were able to use whatever force they had available to them. With the war over, the Nazis not being a problem, the Japanese militarists not being a problem, they had a free hand to do whatever they wanted to seize power and consolidate power and expand power in their countries. And there was no way after World War II, with 12 million men and women who had been in uniform, America did like America has always done at the end of World War II. We wanted to demobilize and get back to normal, whatever that whatever that was going to be. Stalin understood that. And with a nuclear weapon in his hands by 1949, there was going to be no more competition, no direct conflict. So when you have that kind of political system, you can achieve your ends in just about any way that you can creatively think of. Thank you. That's always amazing to me how that can happen so quickly. Do we have anyone else that has any questions? I have a question. Uh, where Where is uh, Trotsky buried? He's buried, buried. He's buried in Mexico City. Oh, uh, okay. Good. They never in brought fact, him back to Russia, did they? No, he never. His His body would never have been brought back to Russia okay. during Stalin's time. And after that, after Stalin died, there was I don't think there was any kind of inclination to do so. Thank you. Sure. But that is a fascinating story about, about Leon Trotsky and Stalin, the power struggle. To think that Stalin sent, a, sent an agent halfway around the world to take care of this guy who, quite frankly, was just not, wasn't a physical threat to him, just an ideological threat. I have a question about the, uh, the map of uh, the division of uh, Europe between the uh, Allies and Russia. Uh, on that map, there's uh, the the U.S. zone, British zone, the Russian zone, and the French zone in blue. Where, there's another there's another uh, zone shown there on the lower left, uh, the the west side of the uh, uh, French zone. Let me get that back. Uh, I, I wasn't aware there was another zone. Let me find that for you. Okay. I'm going to reshare the screen. So you're talking about right below the yeah. French zone, right? There you go, to the, uh, uh, to the uh, left of the French zone. Right. I got to find out what that is, Burl. Okay. All right. It, it looks like, well, it looks like it, it would be uh, Austria, but it's uh, a little far north. I, I don't know. I, I mean, if you look at the flag, you see the British Union Jack uh -huh. in the green zone, the Soviet, the hammer and sickle in the red zone. Correct. The stripes in the orange zone uh -huh. and the, the tricolor of the French flag in the French zone. But I, I just got to find out what nation that flag belongs to. That's it. That, I did not even notice that. That's a good catch. Okay. All right. I was just wondering. Sure. Other Thank questions? Yeah. Sure. Other questions, comments, observations? Well, thank you everyone for attending this evening. It was another incredible lecture. And I know myself, every time I hear one of these, I learn so much more and it broadens my perspective on so many different aspects of this conflict that we all thought ended on a certain date in 1945, and but continued on. We will be continuing next week without Fred, we will miss him desperately, but we will have him back in the spring. And when we start our next lecture series, which will deal with America's roles post Vietnam up until 1990, which should be very intriguing to look at because that's a part of American history where our military was actively engaged in many different NATO and South American conflicts and we never talk much about it. We have a whole generation of veterans that were very actively engaged in so many different conflicts and we very seldom ever speak of them. So we'll be doing that, um, having that conversation and those lectures 
come the spring. Next week, we'll have Ron Janowski. And if any of you have come to our lecture series before, um, Ron is retired um, Army and he is a wonderful speaker and his area of expertise is Korea, Vietnam and the Cold War. And so he'll be very wonderful to listen to next week and we look forward to having you all then. Um, if you have any questions, please always continue to email Teresa and she can answer any of those. And anything else that you'd like, please let us know. We're always looking for wonderful ways to serve our mission. And the mission of the Silver Sides is simple. It is to honor the veterans and we do that through education and preservation. You all know about our preservation of how we preserve our artifacts, especially the Silver Sides and the McLean, but every single artifact in the building. And again, we do it through education such as this where we bring to light the conflicts that have been on. So thank you very much for joining us tonight. And we look forward to seeing you again next week. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you, Fred. Uh, Silver Size Museum. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. Bye. Take care. You too.